Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick Podcast with me, Michael Tinkser. We at Hospitality Mavericks are here to inspire leaders to create hearts in them and profitable businesses from the inside out. The kind that both employees and customers love and support. In this episode, we go for a trip down under to talk with Sean DeVace, the founder and director of the Open Pantry Co., a hospitality consultancy. Sean is also a hospitality professional with more than 20 years of experience from the front line, senior management roles, to running his own businesses. And he's also a host of a great podcast called the Open Pantry Podcast. A must listen to if you are in the hospitality industry. Great guest and gems in this. We talked about the pandemic and how it's impacted the Australian hospitality market. Sean tells they are now hit by a second lockdown in restaurants in Melbourne. And he fears that this is going to be very hard to come back from for many operators. Sean shares his learnings from what great and progressive operators are doing to navigate and survive the current climate. We also discuss how the industry will change and become an elevated industry of service, value and leadership. Sean gives some solid advice on what he thinks operators should be doing right now to survive and thrive. During this episode, I almost could feel the sadness a second lockdown breaks. There's many great insights from another market in here. So grab your notebook, coffee, and enjoy. Hello, everybody out there, and welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast. We are in mid-July, and today we are traveling on to the other side of the world, actually down under, and we have Sean from Melbourne on from the Open Pantry, and uh, I'm really looking forward to this because there's actually things happening both in uh, Australia, but also around the world that we maybe haven't seen coming yet in Europe. It feels a bit like they're a bit of a head of the curve, but Sean, he will probably tell you much more about that. So Sean, welcome to the podcast. I've really been looking forward to this conversation. We tried to try to get this organized a couple of times, but we needed a pandemic apparently. <laughs> to get together. What a pleasure it is to be, to be on a podcast, which is, uh, uh, something I've I've looked at and listened to for uh, for a little while now, and um, uh, mate, you are the aficionado of everything that's happening in hospitality in Europe for sure. So I, I feel very uh, honoured to be on your on your show. So thanks so much for having me on. Oh, I think the honour honour goes uh, the same way here. Uh, <laughs> there's no doubt about that. Uh, you you definitely have a, a coverage about the Australian market that uh, that that really helps to put things in perspective. And I think it feels like even prior to pandemic, and we can come back to that. It feels like as hospitality, it started as we could connect more on social and all these podcasts happening. Actually, the, the problems were the same across the world. It's not a uh, it's not a market or European thing or American thing or an Australian thing or it's it's actually globally our challenges. But back to you, Sean. For people that, that doesn't know who Sean is and, and what you're up to, you have a podcast, you are have a consultancy business, you have been involved in the industry for years, you run your own businesses. Can you give a bit of a an overview to people out there? All right. Simply I've been in hospitality since I was sixteen. That's now going on uh twenty three years now. Uh so it feels Feels like a long time some days, but other days it feels like I've only really just begun. Uh, I I started out as a as a baker uh, when I was sixteen uh, for a massive um, retail bakery brand here called Bakes Delight, and um, they had about uh, about two hundred three hundred locations across Australia and New Zealand at that point when I joined in the late nineties and was lucky enough to work with a, a really great franchise or um, a franchisee I should say who became a multi-sider and I got the uh, got the urge to really develop my b- baking career and become a manager at the age of 20 and, and start, you know, managing teams of 15 and 20 and, and, and those kind of things. It was really, uh, really exciting. I became a franchisee at the age of 21. Bakes Delight came to me and said, hey, do you want to, do you want to buy a bakery? And I said, sure. And, um, and bought a bakery at the age of 21, which made me the youngest, um, the youngest franchisee in Australia, which was a pretty cool claim to fame at that point. Then I bought a second bakery when I was 20, 25, 26. Things were going well. I was um, working a whole heap, probably 80 to 100 hours a week and, and, and really passionate about my businesses. But 
you know, there were there were a lot of things which were challenging for me at that point, running those bakeries. And I unfortunately had a car accident when I was 27. So I was uh, involved in a high-speed car accident um, as a passenger, uh, which, uh, which led me into a tree, unfortunately, at about 120 k's. Um, that took me, took me out of commission, out of my businesses for about seven or eight months where I couldn't actually bake bread, which was, um, really, really hard for me. I, uh, unfortunately put the, put those businesses into liquidation about a year afterwards, um, which, which meant I really had to think about, um, think about what I was doing moving forward. So I, uh, went and worked for a quick service restaurant group. Um, bakery group, uh, bakery group, uh, a burger group called Grilled, which was um, which was on the up when I came into working with them in sort of 2009. Um, they only had about 10 or 12 stores around the country and I um, got a position as a restaurant manager with them uh, up in Brisbane. Started to run some restaurants, became an area manager, became um, a part owner um, in one of the stores um, and then I went to Perth for six months to fix up a couple of restaurants over there for them as well. That's about five or six years with Grilled. Um, an amazing time when I left. They had about 100, 110, 120 odd restaurants. Decided I wanted to live and work in Melbourne about five years ago. And that saw me come here. I worked for a couple of other QSR brands. I ran a, a sourdough bakery brand. Uh, so I came back to bread. Um, for a year that was incredible um uh we did retail over three sites but also did wholesale for the likes of uh dinner by heston and and some amazing chefs here in in victoria and then about four years ago three years ago i decided to start open pantry co and and that was about me wanting to want to make the industry better i felt i had a lot of knowledge to give and i wanted to make sure i could share that um over the industry, over many brands, rather than just have a, a job, and uh, and that's what happened. And I probably the biggest claim to fame was a um, was a fried chicken brand that came out of Singapore and launching their three sites here in Australia, one in Melbourne and and two in Brisbane, and they bought a part ownership in a Mexican brand here, which they're going to scale back into Asia. So it's been a been an interesting ride, and then and then obviously in between that of had a hospitality podcast for the last sort of two years or so and um yeah we're up to about 80 episodes now which is awesome and um allows me to connect with amazing people like you michael and and obviously uh, a lot of people around the world talking about you know my favorite thing which is hospitality and food so that's kind of my story <laughs> well that that sounds like a what i was to call a true student of uh, the hospitality industry and then, uh, like like we all have been hit by, we were hit by the pandemic about four months ago. And uh, I'm sure there's people out there thinking, what has actually, you know, in, in top line, what has happened in Australia since the, the first lockdown? And where are you now? Just to get that picture of the situation over there. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, I think the benefit for you and for me is that we get to talk to so many different brands and have a good understanding of what the whole hospitality space is like. I'm sure you agree, Michael, that we're probably finding people are more honest than ever about where their businesses are at. So I think, um, I mean, for us in Victoria and in Melbourne, we're in just the start of a uh, second lockdown. Um, this at the moment is going to be um, a six-week lockdown. We're in the second week of that. So the optimism that came with the opening in sort of the start of June where most venues were able to trade uh, to 20 people. Um, so in Australia, we've done it a bit differently to the rest of the world. We haven't done it as a percentage of, you know, percentage of normal guests. We've done it as actual, you know, units of people that are allowed in venues. So most of pubs and restaurants and, and cafes were allowed to have 20 people as long as they kept to one person per four square metres um, in dining space. And then that went on for four weeks and in Melbourne, um, we had some uh, some flare ups in cases, and now that's resulted today as we as we speak, you know, sort of mid July, that we've had the biggest number that we've ever had since the start of the crisis. So I think the industry as a whole is probably down upwards of eighty to ninety percent, even with delivery pickup takeaway, and it's quite scary. I mean, 
I'm, I'm, I know you'd agree, Michael. Um, it's just it's just a really unfamiliar time. No one has a playbook. No one knows how this is gonna um, is gonna end if it's gonna end, and it's just confusion. And it's really really tiring for the industry um, to know what to do next and and what the real options are. I'm lucky enough to be um, I'm lucky enough to be sort of one of ten advisors. With I know one of your one of your previous guests, um, Ivan Brewer, with the Melbourne City Council, um, and we're helping them sort of formulate some uh, some ideas about how the Melbourne City Council can can help the industry as well as the state government. So we're the you know the second biggest economy in Australia. So it's um it's really important that we make the right moves for the for the whole industry. Have you seen any you know consequences? Because you know. Uh, what you know happened just here in the UK and Europe is that again we 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 have been through that we have opened now we are trading we are in the UK two weeks into trading and this is uh, the the weeks are coming now is the school holidays yes uh, normally very big uh, trading weeks here in in the UK and a lot of operators are looking to recover a bit or getting a bit of cash in the in the bank to to survive the the autumn where there's potentially a, a second peak coming because i don't think we're going to have a what we need is principle the, the vaccine to cure cure the thing what is happening in, in australia how, how how has actually impacted the the market have the brand left the scene over there because we've definitely seen that already in the uk we have seen some some big brands actually packing up or restructuring or in in the process of it and 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 a lot of independent that hasn't opened their doors either a choice or they're never going to open again I think what we're seeing in, um, especially in Victoria and probably to a lesser extent in New South Wales and Sydney, is about ten percent of venues already closed. Um, by all survey data that we're seeing, there's another ten percent, eight to ten percent, which are currently trading, which don't think they'll last past six months. So that was before the second lockdown happened. Um, and I think the word on the street, and this seems to be a worldwide example is that 30 to 40 percent of venues will close um melbourne and victoria is going to be in real trouble because this second lockdown of six weeks um is i just don't know how you know they're going to trade um past it um you know we're obviously on a furloughed scheme um with some staff um like you guys are in the uk um, you know, there's some uh, government subsidies of sort of five to ten thousand dollars Australian. You know, some there'll be some payroll relaxation, some liquor licensing that won't need to be paid in 2020. But um, if you're not sitting on cash before this, you're in you're in real trouble. We're not we're not really seeing um, you know bigger brands say they're going to you know cut units of of stores or anything like that to this extent. I know there's. There's obviously been some um, rationalisation of support offices across the country with bigger brands, but we're, we're not seeing um, units go down yet. Um, I think quick service restaurants are largely okay if they're in the CBD or sort of five, five kilometres outside the CBD radius, then they're in real trouble. And as you go out further, it seems to be a bit better. Um, and that's, you know, obviously with the working from home kind of scenario that's happened worldwide, you know, cities are just um, not like, you know, nothing like they used to be. There's no atmosphere. There's nothing going on. So it's um, it's a big challenge. My my greatest concern, Michael, is the fact that if if one brand in quick service restaurants especially or one group of cafes um, decide they're going to start to close some stores, I think you'll see it. Uh, across the board, I think it's just, you know, it's waiting to happen and uh, it's just a matter of when. Definitely, you can already see the domino effect here in, in the UK. And also, I think there, there was many of them were very close to being in a very vulnerable position pre-pandemic as well. And I think this has just, you know, given them the last push and now they're trying to, to save the, the, the pieces they can. Um, some really big brands over here, Caluchos is one of them that has already gone through it. Uh, and there's more coming in the and in, in the coming coming months. That's no doubt about that. And especially if we in in in, in this part of the world also going to be hit by a, a second lockdown, then we definitely uh, going to see some some casualties here. 
I talked with somebody in the U.S. the other day, uh, Josh Couple, and he said that he said that that the, the talks in the U.S. across the country is sixty five percent of potentially your units is not going to survive in the 12, 18 months period. And that's quite brutal. So he said some of it will be picked up and reopened, but with the existing owner or the existing infrastructure of people will not happen. There will be a lot of liquidation going on and land grabbing. So yeah, it's a, it's it's very sad because there's a lot of people's jobs and livelihood there's on, on the, and, and people are going to be scarred for years. You, you tried it yourself. You told you've been through a, a liquidation. And that's a, that's a tough, tough game. It's not just a, a process of paper. It's something that, that haunts you for, for years to recover from as an operator. Yeah, I think, look, I don't want to get too dark too early, Michael, but I think we need to, you know, we're obviously talking about, you know, capital investment with um, with these situations. And one of the reasons why I'm starting to talk about my liquidation again in sort of, you know, 2008, 2009 is because, I'm concerned and I'm already hearing rumors of it in the industry that the human capital is going to be a much greater loss. And um, especially we have to recognize that um, a lot of venues and a lot of hospitality groups are still concentrated, uh, are still run by by men and they are always over, overrepresented in, in, you know, the kind of situations around suicides. And I think I think we really need to make sure that we are supporting each other and talking to each other and making sure that banks and financial institutions which control the levers of how this crisis is maintained, we need to make sure that we're controlling it. Like really thinking about empathetic nature in this time because, um, yeah, the, the loss, the human capital is, is much greater loss than anything else. On the podcast, I've had two uh, ladies on, uh, Elaine Bato and Vicky Barnes, both uh, working with mental health um, uh, within the industry and other industries. And and they talked about a general in society, a second wave of, uh, you know, a, a challenge. You know, one thing is the pandemic, the mental health crisis is even bigger because the the, 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 the situation people are going to travel to, the, the stress they're going to be put under as you just, and I think you're, you're right, we have a very big job in making sure that we we don't trigger that uh, uh, in in a way that will be very very unhealthy uh, for for all of us and and it will have some consequences for for people's life and families and and so on yeah because maybe the burden is so big financially that you you just can't see your way out of it if we we turn it around and look a bit like okay what can we then learn for the agile operator the, the leading edge operator what are they doing to to survive and 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 bounce back what are you seeing in australia what kind of clever things have you seen because innovation is incredible when you need to do it in a way and i've been quite impressed about how fast things can move you and you remember how quick this industry is to adapt um and uh, normally you the we're talking about oh it takes too long time to implement tech and so on but it's gone so fast over the the last four months there's so much happening but what are like the top three things you've seen the the savvy operators are doing out there i, I think one of the first things michael is they're they're really looking at their workforce component um you know a lot of the owners um or headline managers are getting back on the tools and really understanding their business again because they're working day to day and you know, listening to what their customers want and and making quick decisions. So that's been that's been good to see. Um, the unfortunate side of that is obviously that you know a lot of a lot of casual staff or part time staff um, have had to be let go, and you, you can't really concentrate on when they're going to be back. It's it's an unfortunate uh, unfortunate thing. Um, they're cutting down their menu, so they're they're looking at really what sells. Um, across their menu, making sure it's a lot tighter, a lot leaner, uh, focusing on the marketing for those items, making sure there's ingredients which go across a lot of different menu items and making sure their cost of goods are in line, um, which is which is a, probably the biggest change. Um, and then obviously offering delivery. Like there's been a lot of high-end um, premium restaurants which um, have always hated Uber Eats, Deliveroo, DoorDash, whatever the, whatever the delivery mode is. Um, because they haven't liked um, they haven't liked the the percentage and all that kind of stuff that um, that's been taken from them, which is totally totally valuable. And they've moved to some white label apps or 
um, moving to a delivery model um, themselves where they're, um, they're delivering their own product, which has been awesome to see. So I think those are the, those are the top sort of three things. Um, it's, quite, it's quite amazing to see what can happen in a, in a crisis um, when people need to survive. They all of a sudden become incredibly innovative and, uh, and doing fantastic things. So that's been the positive which I've seen the speed again uh, the agileness and i think i think that that this is this is here to stay as i said to some people you will be in this constant uh, situation of launching new things to figure out what works and doesn't work you can't predict it you can't say we have a, a three year plan you're down to have a, a maybe a three month plan you you're almost working like a tech company on your tech product and your tech product is your business and you just have to evolve all the time and your brand have to to change if it doesn't work. And you say, and you will have this input because what I've seen is exactly what you've seen. The operators are now back in their stores, even if they have one or two or three, both small and big ones. You see CEOs out on the road, you know, uh, and this is actually how hospitality should be done in in my view. And, th- and this is what the best operators did before the pre-pandemic and the best bosses I had or the best people I worked with, they're out there in the front line trying to understand what works and doesn't work and fixing things very quickly. And I think it's that frontline focus you're talking about. Uh, but that's very interesting. I've see, seen exactly the same thing, you know, CEOs going into vans to drive around with PPE and stuff like that. Um, what about uh, the future then? Uh, how do you see it from, you can take it a bit of a, a an angle for for where you are. And, and it, 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 it could, I, I can understand it's very dire right now. If you can use that expression in, in Melbourne, but how do you see the future in general for food drinks? If we just go, you know, take the crystal ball and travel 12, 18 months out in time, what do you think is going to happen? It's funny. I, uh... In, I think, January or February, I wrote some pieces around um, how I believe that um, brands were going to focus, obviously before the pandemic, that brands were going to focus on singular products and they were going to focus on smaller venues. And I think that will that thought process will now come home to roost. I think you'll see a lot of um, sub-brands come off major brands that will just focus on one core product Um, and do it really well in a small space where they can control the experience a lot more um, and really deliver on quality. Um, We're seeing that in Melbourne here. We've got a a croissantory called Loon, which um, has has got two stores in Melbourne. They're probably going to hopefully put one in Sydney soon. And basically that's what they do is just croissant, really, really simple method, Um, some good collaborations with... um, quality other restaurants and they might do a special croissant or something like that um, and promote the hell out of it um, only for a short time, limited time. So it brings speciality and it brings excitement around their brand. It's really, really intelligent way to do it. So I think we'll see a lot more concentration on certain products rather than bigger menus like we've seen sort of the last 10 years. We'll see a lot more value-driven concepts. So by value, I don't mean cheap. Um, I, I, I do believe that the Domino's, the McDonald's, the KFC's during this time will, will exponentially increase their year-on-year sales by at least 6 to 8%. But I think the value-driven concepts largely helped in, you know, in QSR venues will uh, continue to grow units if they can get through this time. And I think delivery strategy will, will be really important moving forward. Um, I think we'll see a lot more ghost kitchens or dark kitchens, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and I think you'll see within those dark kitchens, uh, brands doing, let's say, a, a burger concept, and then they will buy licensing product for a dessert brand um, and have that as part of one whole concept in which they do out of a ghost kitchen. Um, I think the economies of scale uh, just make sense. And We'll just see a lot more smaller venues with um, less capital expenditure in in fit outs, especially for the next two to three years. You know, going to the days of two, three, four million dollar fit outs um, for restaurants is just too big a risk, and I, I don't think we're going to see um, banks um, want to 
want to try and fund those kind of projects, it's just it's just too hard to know what's going to happen. So, um, so I think that's where we're going to that's where we're going to see it. We're going to become a lot more experiential, a lot more brand driven, a lot more marketing driven, and a lot more focused on a core product being the one thing that uh, a brand wants to promote heavily. You touched a bit on some franchise businesses. How do you see that they will uh, uh, manage this situation? Because the franchise model is that you know you have a, a local operator and they 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 run the the store and then they have to pay a royalty and then that royalty can be you know I haven't haven't have any data on this, but I'm I've been thinking that will for some franchise businesses be a challenge to take that royalty because it 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 absolutely then just kill the P and L in a way and therefore they don't make any money and therefore it's not valuable to be part of this model anymore yeah i think michael the challenge is if 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 you're in the coffee space and you're on the or if you're in the burger space or you're in the mexican space if you're in if you're in these big um spaces of food where there's so many different brands if you're not one two or three in those in those buckets then i think you're in trouble um it but it really depends on where you're positioned location wise uh, a lot of those franchised food brands are in shopping centers which are arguably going to be very hard to um, to talk about rent um, and I do agree with you like most franchisors will take anywhere between sort of six percent upwards of 11 percent of revenue top line revenue from franchisees um, and if you can't get your rent down and you know you're probably not going to pay more for your cost of goods and your at the moment, too scared, especially in a franchise model, to charge more to the customer, it's going to be really tough. Some franchise brands I've worked with before, like talking with their franchisees the last the last month or so, like the franchisors are trying to do um, free offers, and you know that brings uh, disgruntled franchisees who are feeling they're giving away a product for no, for no apparent value. So it's a it's it's a really hard time for everyone, um, but it's. Um, if if you're in a shopping center at the moment and you're and you know your your brand that you bought into is number five in coffee um, in the market, then um, you really need to think about your options because I'm not sure how your brand's going to continue to flourish during this time. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, because there's only that amount of market left as we the pandemic unroll. We also have uh, we haven't even touched on that uh, a potentially massive economic crisis on the back end and that means you know less spent and when you spend you spend probably where you feel safe and where you trust the brand um and you're going to be very aware about how you spend your food dollars as i call them um because also you you reflected a lot over the pandemic as a consumer you become much more savvy you have other demands to 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 your your food providers and and restaurants and, and retail and so on whatever you're trading at the moment in the first couple of weeks of of coming out of lockdown is not real so it's 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 not real data that you can really move on and make decisions on you can't because most venues i reckon because people have been cooped up for two three four months whatever whatever that sort of lockdown process has been naturally the first four weeks of that four to six weeks is probably going to be this massive uplift because people have held probably held cash and they want to treat themselves and they want to spend more on food but that is not reality. It's gonna it's gonna come down twenty to thirty percent in the next in month two and month three if we get no more lockdowns. So you need to really think about that as you as you you know make plans for your brand moving forward because you can't you can't think that you know if you've had a ten percent upswing or twenty percent upswing in sales in your first week or two weeks of trading back that that's not what's going to be prolonged. No, I, I totally agree, and I think. Um... It's actually different. Some people, I think a very small group of people have seen this uplift definitely here. Most people have seen trading numbers about 40 to 50% of uh, previous and, and London and London is dead. Yes. Yeah. There's no one traveling into London. You said cities are a challenge. You know, a lot of, lot of change will be challenged by the office uh, workers that's not traveling and the tourists, of course, as well. As a massive part of, of of London, but London is a, a unique unique hospitality environment. 
Um, but also, I think there is some, you know, what I've seen around here, it's quite interesting to see the, the, the entrepreneurship that happened, like pop-ups happening already. People are very, um, very creative. They're starting now to, you know, make a, you can take a hole in the wall and operate from that's almost allowed again. It doesn't have to be perfect. Anymore. No, not at all. No, people, people are just happy to have brands back. Like it's, it's actually been, it's actually been interesting to see some CBD focused brands go to suburbs and do, you know, uh, a sublease with a cafe or something and do a night service out of a cafe. Um, like that's a really cool thing that, uh, that has been so hard for the industry to try and pull off because, you know, two brands in one space that don't really talk to each other, like that hasn't been something that, um, you know, uh, renters have wanted to see but, um, or have allowed to happen. But, you know, now it's happening, which is, um, which is fantastic. I guess you you agree. Like I have the the view, we 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 will get through it. It's just an absolutely horrible journey we need to be on. But how do you think uh, it's gonna look? Uh, the the average you know restaurant business on the other side are they gonna be smaller organization? Are they is the, the, the primarily the larger one that will come out of this really well and stronger how, how do you see that the market would change i don't know how the, the percentages would big change in the australia compared to 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 independent operators uh here in the uk it's about 16 percent and maybe a bit less now there's branded restaurant chains and the rest is uh, scattered around leisure and, and independent restaurants yeah i think i think for us um it, it's probably a larger extent of of independence um here um Australia is a tough place to to scale um, most franchise business um, and branded businesses because we are so large. Um, so it is a it is a quite hard um, hard thing. I think you know going back to what I said before, Michael. I think we're going to see uh, a lot more smaller format restaurants, and we're going to see a lot more uh, smaller groups. There's you know um, Josh um, from. From the US, who you mentioned before, like he's he's a fantastic guy. I know he's very well connected in California, and you know him saying sixty five percent is scary, but I think that's probably correct. Um, I think arguably we're looking at thirty to forty percent um, in Australia that'll that'll lose in this crisis in, in the first twelve months. Um, I, uh, you know, in the cities, I think you'll see a lot of. Um, premium brands go that rely on tourism and rely on you know theater shows to be happening and concerts to be happening in order to get people um to get people coming to their venues um again value is just going to be key but i think a lot of franchise brands if we talk about that um if they have been on the edge of um not really having a good brand that's been exciting or been different if they've got a me to me too strategy and a me too product, then they are likely to lose um, a lot of a lot of their franchisees and a lot of their units, um, if not the whole brand, um, because probably what's propped them up the last two three years especially has been private equity money, and private equity money is going to is going to dry up um, all around the world, um, but especially places that are, are quite small really in in parallel in Australia, so. Um, so it's a definite challenge. It's going to be a leveling in the industry. So you almost have to ask yourself the question: Is the way that we did things pre-pandemic actually the right way? Is this actually the opportunity to get a business model that actually works for everyone, for the owner, for the the, the staff, the guests, the community, and and in the last end, the planet as well? I think that's the question as well. Because what I've seen many times when you have these amazing situation where brands are scaling it often breaks at some point there's not many success story stories out there uh and uh and i think i think this is the time thinking about when we you deal with food and, and people maybe there is an upper limit to what's possible and the speed this can happen in um because you're you're dealing with such a fluctuating thing and and you know you need to make sure you make money you cannot just build on the dream that is fueled by by equity money because equity money has a consequence if you just said they will there will be a bill one day to pay absolutely um someone someone's going to pay it right someone's going to pay for those fit outs someone's going to pay for the amount of sites you want to put on the ground like there's there's been a lot of smoke and mirrors and what i call the nightclub effect um for hospitality 
in the last you know five to ten years where you know a lot of money has come from obviously from private equity but also you know usually four or five guys getting together and getting you know coming from the finance industry or coming from commerce or or you know coming from a different industry and always wanting to do a cafe or or a pub or something like that and you know five of them will put a lot of money together and put it into a uh, put it into an establishment which they don't have enough experience in and and you know we're going to see that stop which which in the end is a is a is a really good thing for the industry the industry will will come back to being hospitable will come back to being experience led and driven and and all those things but the the financial carnage along the way is going to be extreme so i think uh, you know, if you're a business owner listening to this great podcast, if you haven't been trending positively before pandemic, you are not going to you're not going to trend positively post pandemic, and and you really need to think about your financial situation at the moment. Think about what you've got on the line. Think about you know who who's really connected with your business moving forward because. You want to make decisions that are right for you right now. You don't want to make a decision in 12 months' time, which means you lose your house or, you know, means you lose friendships, you know. So it's, um, it's a really tough thing to say, Michael, but really there needs to be a reality check if you're an owner, which is owing and owing about what to do with their business at the moment. Yeah, and it's so tough because there's so much passion often put into it. But this is the time not to... It's also asking you, what kind of life do I want to live? If you are in that positioning, I think it's only going to get worse. And sometimes you have to stop. And uh, actually, the best decision you can make sometimes is to stop and actually accept failure and then move on from that, uh, which is a very hard thing. And I think that there is some kind of thing, you know, in general in hospitality, and I've been there myself, where you, you, uh, you're you just so focused on that you don't want to look like a failure. But right now, if there is a time to restart or really, you know, get out of this before it actually becomes too big and you get too many enemies and financial that this is the time i think this is the, the, the your moment uh, you're not going to get a moment like this and it's not going to be easy but it definitely maybe there's some 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 really big question to ask yourself also because you only have one life yourself as a if you are the operator and and the stress you have to go through every every three months six months you you postpone this before somebody else makes that decision can sometimes be uh, it can be even harder when other people make the decision for you. I think the I think the positive a couple of positive things about you know going into liquidation or bankruptcy at this time as well, Michael. You know across the world, most of most of the governments have relaxed, you know their bankruptcy laws, um, and in in this time you can just blame the failure of your business on the pandemic, right? And and it won't be you know maybe the scarlet letter that you're concerned about. You know, when I went into liquidation, you know, upwards of 12 years ago now, like that was the, obviously the worst thing I'd been through pretty much in that time, like, you know, to my life at that point. But I was just so worried in how people would judge me, you know, and it's, it's quite, it's, it's quite a humbling moment if, you know, if it comes to that point, because you realize who is important to you in your career and you realize who's going to support you afterwards. And I think the positive in the industry at the moment is that the industry has never been as connected as it, as it has been. And, um, and, you know, as wanting to help each other as it has been. So I think if you are, if you're on the point now where you're listening to this and you're in trouble and you don't want to face up to it, you really need to have some hard and fast conversations and realize that this isn't, this isn't going to define your life moving forward. You need to make decisions which are making sure that your the rest of your life isn't in trouble because of decisions you aren't making now. Yeah, and I think the worst thing you can do is not making decisions oh, right now and moving forward. There's a lot of people sitting and waiting and looking what others does. And I've, you know, there was a long, should, should we keep open and doing delivery? We never done delivery. You said, I think the best thing you can do, if you can keep open, keep open, keep trading, in some kind of form, if it's one to one or two staff, whatever it is, 
it actually makes your innovation go much quicker. And I'm still a believer of that. Everything I've been involved with, we have been trying to keep the uh, the doors open in the best possible way, either feeding hospital people or because it actually in one of those businesses, a great innovation came out of it, like new menus set up, uh, the other new cost structures, better margins, um, faster production. All those things would have not come if we just furloughed the business as we could have done. But we actually then kept, you know, the innovation going. I think that's 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 one of the the messages I think that's very important out there. Um, besides, well, but yeah, it is time for for reality check. Uh, there's no doubt about that. What are you doing yourself, Sean? Because the, 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 this mod has also you know it impacts you as well uh, as part of the industry. What do you do to keep yourself uh, in a good place in all this? You know, in a balanced place, or whatever you call it. What a good question. Um, I suppose I made I made the decision after I was so I was uh, working with a salad brand here um, in Melbourne in March, and obviously got let go from that because I was um, looking after their three stores and you know forty odd staff, and um, we were you know had some good funding and going to expand the brand, and obviously that that changed pretty quickly. So um, so I decided I would do a hell of a lot more podcasts and have more conversations. Um, I'm a really good listener, so I think, and I knew it was important for me to stay connected to the industry. So I wanted to have more and more conversations, and that was my way to help um, the industry and give back. Um, you know, I've got a great partner um, who really is patient with me, which is not the easiest thing all the time, and um, and she listens to me and and you know listens to my problems and um, and you know, talks to me about what she thinks the solution should be. So, I mean, that's always great. Um, I've got a really good family network. I've got, you know, great colleagues, which I talk to um, on a regular basis. You know, I see a psychologist every month um, to talk through stuff that I, you know, can't talk to people I know about, I feel, and, and that kind of stuff. So I think that's probably what's kept me sane um, and, and as positive as I possibly can be. Um, this second lockdown has been really tough. And and I probably found myself reaching out to people I know more, um, just to you know just to feel like everything is going to be okay and I'm going down the right path. And um, probably with the consulting, you know, as we talked about before the podcast, Michael, just just working on new methods of how I can support the industry and and probably part of that is you know supporting people's HR and payroll structure and um, and operations uh, in the back end of their establishments, you know, all the unsexy stuff, um, in order to to make a difference because you know um, there won't be many venues um, outside of fast food that will be opening up over the next two years, I believe. Um, so you know, it's pretty hard to consult on independent brands that aren't opening. So um, so it's a that's a big challenge. <laughs> I call it like having a black box and you have your flashlight and you're looking around in that box for <laughs> what is the next thing. So that that's how I feel sometimes. So I I've totally follow you on that one. Uh, but I, there will be a rise in the industry again. I'm sure they will come back. As my my uh, my mom, uh, which was a restaurateur herself, always said, uh, she said that, that there's two things that are certain in her life. People are going to eat and they're going to die. So it's going to be a job for the undertaker <laughs> and the restaurateur. <laughs> But it's just about how you position your product. Yes. And, uh, and she's so right. It's uh, true. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, so, yeah. So what if uh, you were giving like, because you, you've seen, seen now, you've seen the second lockdown. I think that's very interesting. If You don't have to take that angle. But in the end of the conversation, I always ask people if um, you could give like three advice to leaders out there. What would your three advice be in, in the current situation we are in the world what are the three things that leaders should focusing on right now and really hold i think um really th in this time really think about where you get your information from and think about who you talk to i think obviously as i just sort of um said there michael having a really good circle of people you trust around you is the most critical part of you know of your life no matter what industry you're in so so making sure that you have people you can talk to about your situation and you have, you know, a great staff base um, that you feel trusted with and, 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 and feel like you can move your brand forward. You need to have a fantastic relationship with your landlord right now. They need to understand 
where your business is at and you need to understand where their position is at because that alone is going to directly probably control what you are going to do next. Um, you need to be less proud in this situation moving forward in order to make proper decisions about your business. But the landlord, the rental bill is usually the biggest um, fixed cost outside of cost of goods and, and obviously labour. So you need to make sure you can negotiate that, whether that be on percentage of revenue, whether that be um, an extension of your lease and deferred for later in the lease. Like you need to make sure that's going to work. Um, and, and definitely lastly, you need to understand your P&L. The amount, of, the amount of venues I've worked in, Michael, I'm not sure if you'd, um, you've had the same, um, but the amount of venues that do not stock take is abhorrent. If you do not stock take and do not understand your cost of goods, then it's pointless you putting different things on the menu and pricing it in different ways. If you don't know how much it costs, if you don't know what the margins are, if you don't know how that's going to work in a delivery market, you need to understand your P&L and especially your cost of goods. And this is this time is probably the biggest realisation that people have understood um, their wages um, much, much more. Um, it's great that um, hospitality owners are back on the tools and back delivering product and all those things because they've understood what their people do and they've understood how much labour they actually need to put in their venues. Um, I know there's a lot of talk worldwide about um, wages changing and and um, uh, unionisation and all those kind of things. Like It's great for that to be talked to at the moment. I don't think anything is going to be changed anytime soon. So you have to base your assumptions moving forward is that nothing is going to change in the labor space in comparison to how how much you're paying your team so you need to make sure moving forward that you are forecasting it based on um, current costings um, to make sure your business is viable so just understand your PL back to front that's probably the biggest thing i can uh, give you as advice yeah, and I, I totally agree with that. And then this is like one of the big challenges uh, often. Uh, there's often the, for some operators, some are really on top of this, but for, for the majority I've met, they don't have time to, to do that. And there's actually so much technology that can help you today with this. But it's about you need to do the input. You need to do the behavioral thing like stock take. You need to look every day on your schedule and say what went well, what didn't went well, where where did we lose sales? Where did we actually, or where did we actually had too much capacity on compared to sales? Uh, well, how how is the the standards looking when we have so many people on? What does it look like when we have this amount of people on? And there is is every business is different, and there's so much to to be gained there. And if, if there is a time now, this is the time to to really get into this. And then one of the things I'm I'm preaching a lot in moment as well which I know is difficult, uh, even for the business I'm involved in as well, is daily cash flow analysis, understanding when we spend £10 today, what consequence does this have 30 days down the line? Because that's where you're operating right now, 30 days. Yeah, it's great if you can see 12 months ahead as well, but that's not that's important right now. You have to think about survival in very small bursts in a way. And 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 I guess I guess even if you get a loan, you get subsidized. You you have to think about that money burns very quickly. So it's about how do you spend every little pound of that. So I totally agree on on those the the the, the thing and understanding your current position. It, it's it's absolutely key here. I think the if I can speak to the daily part, I think that's so critical at the moment, Michael, because there's you know we're seeing how you know. Uh, government officials might have a um, might have a press conference and that will dramatically change what the next day might look like in hospitality venues so in in regards to sales so we need to make sure that we're looking at those daily sales obviously how much money we're making but also you know what's affecting those sales so we can forecast better because that's going to mean you're going to hopefully make more money during this time and not lose it so it's really critical good point Sean, uh, absolutely amazing to to have you on uh, as a guest here and actually giving this overview of what's going on in Australia. And I can see that you know that there is there is concern, but there's also optimism. So, uh, but again, it's it's nobody knows the journey, and I think that's the that's the that's the big thing we got out of this conversation. Is like we have this uncertainty about 
uh, we thought it was uncertain the last couple of months, but I, I it feels like you are starting to get to a point where I am as well, where I think what is actually coming ahead is even more uncertain. Yeah, because exactly. Now, now, now all the government incentives has been done. We we are there. We are this. You know, we are in the second second phase. I think whatever that is, and now it's about getting into the third phase phase of of things. It's controlling what you can control. That's the most important thing. Exactly. Thank you very much for coming on, Sean. And uh, I'll send you power energy to a, a, a good journey out there. Thank you so much, Michael. It's been um, an absolute honor to be on your podcast. So thanks for having me on. Sean, thank you so much for that great overview of where the Australian hospitality market is when it comes to the pandemic. And also how you think the future of our beloved industry is going to look. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please give us a like, share, rate, or subscribe to one of our channels. Tune in next time for another interview. And in the meantime, find out more about us and subscribe to our newsletter at hospitalitymavericks.com. Thanks for listening and be maverick.